I'd like to point out that this will be a general read. We're looking at the general influence of the stars upon our life. If you would like to know something more specific about your life and how the stars are specifically interacting with you, I would suggest getting a reading with a professional astrologer. You can do so with me through the link in the description below if you would like. I'd like to give a special welcome to anyone who is new to astrology. You're so welcome here at this channel. If you would like to learn to read your own astrology chart, I offer a short course. It's very cheap and it's lots of fun. The link is in the description below. To all of my friends who join me here each week, who like and share my videos and subscribe to my channel, I do love you. To my gold and silver and bronze star family members, I do pray for you every day. I thank the universe for your presence in my life. If anyone would like to join the Guiding Star family, the link is also in the description below. And now to this week's spotlight. wondering when love will come into your life? Did you know that it takes at least three energy triggers to bring love into a person's life? And that there are 62 different triggers for bringing love into your life? If you're an aspiring astrologer, this is something you need to know, as the number one question astrologers get asked is when is love coming into my life? Why not join me for my course in finding out when love will come? Find it out for yourself? find it out for your clients. Let's learn together when the stars will align for love. The link to my astrology course is in the description below. And remember, every one of us deserves to know love. <sighs> Hello, I'm Ksenia and welcome to this series that I've been preparing for you all about Neptune and Neptune's transits through every house in the horoscope and how it will affect your life. Now I've been wanting to do this series for quite some time now, however I decided I'd wait until Neptune had crossed my Ascendant and my First House Lord. In doing so, there's a, there's a strategy behind this. I wanted to see how Neptune would play out in my life on those very significant and key points in my chart. Astrology is 50% reading books and doing courses and getting mentors and teachers. And the other 50% is observation and experience of the planets in your life. So, so the older you get, the more wisdom, the more knowledge that you will have about how planets impact us. So now that I've gone through those particular transits of Neptune in my first house, I feel that I'm ready to talk more in depth about this very watery planet. So let's start by having a look at what Neptune is all about astronomically. So Neptune comes after Uranus in the order of the planets. We have Mercury, Venus, the Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, boom, Neptune. Second to last of the key players in astrology. Pluto is still considered to be a planet of uh, influence in um, astrological circles and therefore Neptune is the second last. Now when Neptune was discovered, it wasn't through observation. They didn't sort of spot Neptune in the sky and go, aha, there it is, because you actually need a telescope to see Neptune. Um, it's not something you can observe with the naked eye. And so Neptune was discovered through mathematics. Basically, the astrologers of the time when Neptune was discovered, and we're going to talk about that when Neptune was discovered in just a minute, but the astrologers of the time were observing Uranus and they had mathematically predicted where Uranus was going to go according to all their observations and then Uranus did his usual quirky thing and did not follow the predicted orbit and so from that they were able to calculate that mm, there must be a planet further out that's pulling on Neptune and its gravitational force has caused it to move in a different way than we expected or anticipated and so because of their mathematical calculations they began to look for another planet beyond Uranus and voila we have Neptune. Now what is very interesting and this is quite telling about the character of Neptune actually as well what is very interesting is that Galileo had observed Neptune back in 1612 he didn't realize that Neptune was a planet. I don't know what he thought it was, but he didn't sort of put two and two together and think, hmm, there's another planet out there. So Galileo had observed Neptune and this was a whole 234 years before the discovery of Neptune. 
Now, why I say this correlates to sort of the ambiguous nature of Neptune is that he's a bit slippery as a planet. It's hard to sort of pin down. So here was Galileo observing Neptune, not realizing what he was, not sort of seeing it for what it was, basically sort of um, under an illusion that Neptune was something else. That is a very Neptunian quality, which we'll talk about very soon. But 234 years later, we had the discovery of Neptune in the real through that mathematical um, observation that I was talking about. This was in 1846. Now, most people know that when we discover pla new planets, there is often um, a rise in consciousness or an a, a, a increase in conscious awareness in humanity on the Earth at the time of the discovery of a new planet. For example, when Uranus was discovered, we had a number of revolutions occurring around the world. What does Uranus correlate to? It correlates to uh, freedom, liberation, equality and equal distribution of resources. And what were these revolutions about all around the world? Well, the, namely the French Revolution was occurring when Uranus was discovered. And that was about no more let them eat cake kind of stuff. No more of the aristocracy living in opulent luxury beyond compare while the, the poor people of the land went hungry and could barely clothe and feed themselves. And of course Uranus, sorry to diverge off Neptune, but Uranus is all about those things, equality. And so the conscious awareness of the planet had reached a point where it was like, no, now hang on, we're not going to take this inequality anymore. We want things to be fairer. We want things to be more even. And lo and behold, at the discovery of Uranus, which rules those things, the consciousness was ripe and ready to embrace that as part of its awareness. Now the same occurs with Neptune, who was discovered a little while after, as I said, in 1846. So what was the expansion of consciousness that occurred at the time Neptune was discovered? Well, we had an invention of photography that had occurred sort of 20 years before. Now, when we're talking about these big planetary discoveries, this is, this is no mediocre discovery. This is really kick-ass stuff. And so we look at the surrounding sort of, you know, 20, 30 years as an era of the discovery of Neptune. Keep in mind when I'm talking about this, that up until the discovery of Uranus in the late 1700s, there had the, the, the existence of planets beyond what you could see with the naked eye was not known, was not proven. And so for thousands of years, the consciousness of humanity had been in a state where it was only aware of what it could see, touch, taste, hear and smell in the real, in the earthly dimension. If you couldn't see beyond Saturn, then there were no planets beyond Saturn. And then all of a sudden, at the discovery of Uranus, boom, we have an awareness of more. And so Uranus was discovered, and then Neptune was discovered. And so the surrounding sort of 30 odd years in the vicinity of 1846, when Neptune was discovered, are Neptunian times. And so we look at what was unfolding in consciousness then. And as I just said a moment ago, photography. Photography was discovered. Uranus, sorry, Neptune rules photography. Um, motion pictures were discovered 30 years or so after the discovery of Neptune. And Neptune rules motion pictures. The spiritualist movements were unfolding around the world. We started to find people who were interested in sort of hypnosis and mesmerism, um, people who would be, you know, looking at channeling people who wanted to conduct seances. These sorts of things started to come into vogue as parlor games, as did the tarot card readings and even astrological readings as sort of, like I said, parlor games, you know, entertainment at fancy people's dinner parties and so on. That was um, the very glamorous side of Neptunian times, using those spiritualist things as entertainments for glamorous people. Plastics were discovered around this time. Braille for uh, the blind, writing for the blind. Antiseptics. Pasteurization was discovered and started to be used. And these are just a few of the advancements that occurred in society 
around the time that Neptune was discovered. We also had cultural movements like Romanticism, the poets, you know, Byron and Shelley um, around this time as well. We had, uh, you know, alongside Byron and Shelley, we had things like um, the, the Frankenstein novel or the um, Dracula novel, which is a very interesting thing. Um, Impressionism was also the, the, the painting style in vogue around this era of history. And we also had the Communist Manifesto that was written. Now, some people, if you're not familiar with politics, the, the, the name communism can conjure up all sorts of negative imagery in your head. But the idea behind communism was a bit like Uranus in that it was about equality um, and compassion to everybody. So these are combinations of both Uranian themes, which is equality um, and sort of even an even playing field for everybody. And also Neptune, which is highly compassionate, um, wanting everybody to ha get an opportunity. Uh, and of course, Neptune, for those who we haven't got to this point yet, but Neptune rules idealism as well. So um, the ideal of the Communist Manifesto was present in these Neptunian times as well. Whether it actually functioned and worked was another matter, but the ideal was there. A utopian vision for society is what Neptune is all about. And so there's no surprise that we had movements in that direction towards that ideal at this time. Back to the astronomy, Neptune is a planet um, that's made up of liquid and ice and it's also full of different gases as well. So it's quite a combination, uh, Neptune, of many things. But it's very similar in its size and its structure to its nearest planet, which is Uranus. They're, they're almost twin-like in many senses, even though they function very differently astrologically. Like Uranus, Neptune is actually circled by some very faint rings of uh, dust. Um, Uranus is in comparatively, Uranus's uh, rings are more visible, but Neptune does have rings as well. Very light, very faint rings around Neptune. If you've seen images of Neptune that were taken, I think it was by the Voyager space probe. I may be wrong there, but um, my memory serves me. I think it was Voyager that took images of Neptune. You'll know that it's this beautiful, serene, blue looking planet that has some wafting sort of white, they look like clouds um, around it occasionally. And despite its very serene looking surface, it is quite a wild planet underneath. So again, that illusionary factor there. On the surface, it looks like it's cool, calm, collected. And underneath, it's not what it's seen. On Neptune, winds whip around the planet at, I have to read this, 2,100 kilometers an hour. And they're furious winds. Uh, not only that, Neptune takes only 16 hours to do a rotation. It's heaps bigger than Earth, Neptune. Lots bigger than Earth. And we take 24 hours as an Earth to rotate. But if you're a monstrous sized planet and you're spinning, doing a circuit of 16 hours, 16 hours, 16 hours, then the gravitational pull of Neptune becomes pretty phenomenal, um, despite the fact that you're mostly made up of gas. So this momentum of the gravitational force from the spin and the winds that whip around Neptune sort of whips up all the ice, methane, hydrogen, helium and ammonia. I had to read that list to make sure I got the chemicals right. Um, whips it all up into a big slushy mess. So it's not this pure ethereal kind of atmosphere or, um, or body uh, of Neptune. It's actually a bit of a slushy wild mess <laughs> when you get down to it. Now, some scientists, and this is very interesting, some scientists have hypothesized just through their calculations and observations that the core of Neptune, which is burning um, iron, very fiery, very hot core, they have hypothesized that there is a layer of diamond, liquid diamond that encircles the core of Neptune. Now, just how they've reached that conclu conclusion, don't ask me, but it is there in scientific journals that this is a hypothesis that could prove true and correct. 
Now this iron core that's burning hot, white hot iron core, is actually bigger than the Earth. So the core, the solid mass, if you like, of Neptune is larger than the Earth. And it's, it burns at about, or its temperature is about 5,000 degrees Celsius. So it's incredibly hot, even though it's so far from the sun and distant from the sun's rays, which is usually where heat comes from in the solar system, this Neptune has its own heat source through this burning iron core. So you're getting the picture? We have this impression of Neptune, of serenity on the outside astronomically, but not quite what it seems deep down. And again, we'll see that represented when we start talking about the, uh, the astrology of Neptune and how it impacts us and therefore how it's going to impact us when it travels through each house. We also can see that it is a very fluid type planet. It's, you know, slushy, slippery. And of course, Neptune rules the watery depths of the ocean, if you're familiar with mythology and the title of Neptune. We'll talk about that in just a second as well. I love the analogy that we're seeing here of this watery fluid planet, but it has a solidness at the core and a preciousness, the liquid diamond. There's something precious at the core of Neptune. Now, Neptune, as we've already stated, is invisible. You cannot see Neptune out on a fine stargazing night. You will always need a telescope to see Neptune. And as the old Hermetic principle goes, as above, so below, the way things appear in the sky from our vantage point on Earth is exactly how they will play out and be represented and reflected in our lives on the planet. What does that mean? Well, it means that the planets we can see with the naked eye, the visible planets in astrology, they correlate and connect to what we experience visibly, tangibly, experientially on the Earth. Our, our touch, taste, sight, sound and smell, you know, the physical things of the experience of being a body incarnate on the earth connect to visible planets and what they rule. When you get to Neptune, actually when you get to Uranus, Neptune and Pluto, they're all invisible without a telescope and therefore they connect to the inner realm of the psyche. What motivates us unconsciously, you know, our behavioral patterns, our, our things we can't help about ourselves, you know, our, our deep psychological wounds and our karmas that we carry with us at the core of our self, at our soul level, they correspond to these invisible planets because as above, so below. We can't see them, therefore it's like the, the part of the iceberg that sits underneath the water. You can't see it, but it's still there packing a whopping punch, especially if you happen to be on the Titanic. So Neptune has at least 14 moons that circle it. It has a greater and denser gravity than the Earth. So if you're standing on Neptune, you will weigh a lot more than you do on the Earth. And it takes longer than one lifetime for Neptune to circle the sun. It takes 165 years. So in your lifetime, you will never see Neptune return to its natal place in your astrological chart. It, you just won't live that long, at least not in this day and age as I'm recording this video. Who knows what science might do in the future, but right now you won't live to be 165 and see Neptune come back to its natal position. Let's explore Neptune mythologically now. Well, Neptune is the name of the Roman god of the sea. Not only the sea though, and the oceans, but also of fresh water. Neptune was the Roman god of fresh water as well. And we often see Neptune uh, in myth mythological pictorial representation with his trident. And of course, what is the symbol of Neptune astrologically? It's a trident. So there we go. So much correlation between um, the mythologies and what plays out in the skies again here. So again, there's no coincidences that when the astronomers discovered Neptune, they didn't know that it was made mostly of liquid and gas. They didn't know it was mostly a fluid planet. But lo and behold, here we are. They gave it the name Neptune, King of the Oceans and Neptune is quite a, an oceanic planet with its liquid mass. Once again, this is showing us how the conscious awareness works, even in unconscious ways. Now, a little bit more about Neptune mythologically was that he was the son of the Titan god Saturn. 
Now, along with Neptune, there was Jupiter and there was Pluto that were the sons of Saturn. And Jupiter, Neptune, Pluto didn't really get along with Saturn very well. If you're familiar with the mythology of Saturn and Jupiter, you'll know that um, the mother of Jupiter hid him away because Saturn had a habit of eating his children lest they rise up against him and take over. So theoretically, in the mythology, Neptune, sorry, Neptune and Pluto were gobbled up by their father Saturn. But then along came Jupiter when he was all grown up to the rescue and Saturn regurgitated his <laughs> offspring. Uh, Neptune and Pluto, there were others as well, but the main ones were Neptune and Pluto, the brothers of Jupiter. And together, Jupiter, Neptune and Pluto overthrew their father Saturn and Jupiter became king of the gods. And we had the reign of the Olympian gods from that point on, which include Neptune and Pluto. So Jupiter, Neptune and Pluto are the Olympian gods. Saturn was the Titan god and Uranus, who was the father of Saturn, just to confuse matters even further, um, was not a Titan and not an Olympian. He was sort of one of the forefathers of them all. In ancient Greece and Rome, they celebrated the role of water in their lives and they had a festival to celebrate this and it was known as Neptunalia. There was also another festival that occurred at the similar time called Furinalia. Um, I won't go into the mythology of, of that name, but they were both celebrated around the same time. So July 23rd and July 25th, the role of water and the preciousness of water in life was celebrated with these festivals. So Neptunalia it was a time of honoring the god Neptune and, and its watery association. So let's take a peek at the astrology of Neptune. I'm going to tell you all about Neptune astrologically. What is Neptune about? Well, as we've already um, come across, Neptune is about illusion, being seeing something and actually realizing it's something else. It's not what it seems. So that can be a number of a uh, number of things can be displayed that way. Glamour. Glamour is ruled by Neptune because if you're glamorous, you know, you've got amazing makeup and hair and beautiful, you know, shimmering, gorgeous clothes and stuff, you look very glamorous. But is that who you really are when you wake up in bed in the, uh, in the morning, you know, and your hair's a tousled mess and you haven't got makeup on and you're wearing your baggy old t-shirt, you might not look glamorous. So there, glamour is ruled by Neptune because it's part of that deception if you like but not a bad deception it's just a deception you know it's not what it seems Neptune in that sense uh, rules glamour Neptune as we've already discussed rules a desire to return to utopia to achieve utopia to create heaven on earth so to speak so that can be a very positive thing if we're wanting to make the world a better place. And Neptune is also quite a compassionate planet. Um, there is a lot of unconditional love that goes along with Neptune, you know, brotherly love. The, the idea of anyone can be saved from their horrible life or, you know, their, their difficulties or their own ill choices in life. Neptune has this sort of unconditional love some might refer to that as this redeemer quality about it and Neptune can be connected to miracles as well because if somebody is raised up from the muck and mire into a, a wonderful life well that is often seen as a miracle and that transformation that occurs is a very um, Neptunian associated thing in astrology. Part of this desire for utopia can actually have connections to a longing to escape the horror and the harshness of earthly reality and those of us who are very Neptunian who have a strong Neptune in our chart or even a strong 12th house or a strong Pisces will know what this is all about. The wanting to escape from earth and earth realities because they're too hard to bear. They're fearful. Earth is a fearful place for these highly sensitive Neptunian Piscean 12th house souls and it's almost too hard. So Neptune is also associated with tremendous longing to tap out, to escape, a longing to go to heaven. Now you'll see a lot of religious groups, fanatical religious groups going down this road where it doesn't matter what I endure in this lifetime, I will be rewarded when I go to heaven and that's all they're living for. They don't, e they don't even engage in earthly reality and earthly life because it's only about heaven and getting to heaven after this horrible life is over. 
That's a Neptunian thing. Also, Neptune has this idea about it of wanting to return to the watery depths, i.e. the womb, you know, being in the embryonic fluid, being safe and secure, not having to sort of struggle and make it on our own because, hey, we've got everything we need. We're warm, we're safe, we're fed, we're in the womb. And Neptune has this desire for that too. So it's a, it's a, a dual desire for paradise, heaven, but also at the same time, a desire to, you know, return to the safety and security of home, so to speak. Neptune can also give a, a longing to be saved. You know, you want your hero to come along and rescue you from this, uh, you know, terrible existence. That's a Neptunian longing. But also if we find that we desire to be the rescuer, we want to be somebody's hero. That's a Neptunian thing as well. So there's often a spiritual connection with Neptune and I'm sure from what I've just described you can see connections in religious circles to saviour mentality, redeemer qualities, longing for paradise. You can see where Neptune's getting its sort of shadow side of spirituality popping up there in, in religious you know, ideology. But Neptune is also in the positive side, which I love to talk about more, is the beautiful connection to angelic realms, to the divine. So if we channel higher wisdom, higher knowledge, that's a Neptune thing. If we're channeling creativity, beauty, art, if we're channeling unconditional love. And now I'm talking about channeling here, not in the sort of, you know, some entity speaking through me, although that is a Neptunian thing. I'm talking about simply expressing things that come from beyond us, beautiful things, gracious things, ethereal things, things that come from beyond the earthly plane. That spiritual side of Neptune is so beautiful. So Neptune is the manifestation of divine love, divine grace and divine creativity, divine creative ideals. He is connected to visualization, imagination, and even healing through visualization and imagination, you know, the, um, the idea that through your thought processes and lifting them to a higher plane, dreaming and aspiring of what it could be that you can heal yourself. And again, we come back to the miraculous component here where people are miraculously healed. Uh, Neptune has connections to um, hypnosis as well and mesmerism. In fact, uh, Mesmer was the man who developed the idea of being uh, hypnotized as a form of healing. So the two are very similar. And, and so Neptune has connections with this as well. It's all very interesting, but Neptune is actually a planet that it is, it's hard to define him, and I use the word him loosely, as a masculine planet. Now, Neptune as a god was a a, um, a masculine god but the expression of Neptune is actually very feminine it errs on the feminine side so um, it would be very interesting to understand exactly how they reached the concept in ancient mythology that Neptune the god of the oceans was actually a man um, I feel maybe that came about at the time of the ancient Greeks and Romans when the patriarchy was establishing itself uh, because really the expression of Neptune is this compassionate, unconditionally loving, highly creative energy which connects more to the water signs and the watery energy which is feminine in astrology. So very interesting there. Neptune is a more feminine energy expression. Neptune rules the sign of Pisces in modern astrology and of course that is a water sign as well. Neptune is also in astrology neither benefic nor malefic. So that means you know we don't put a label of good or bad on him but really with Neptune it it depends what aspects you have to your placement of Neptune in the chart whether he will manifest his shadow side or whether he will manifest his light side in your life and we've kind of talked a little bit about both here now I will talk further about the shadow side in just a second but if you have mostly good aspects like a conjunction we can classify that as a good aspect or um, perhaps a, a trine or a sextile to Neptune from other planets then it's looking good for you. Neptune will tend to express in its more angelic form. It's more miraculous blessed form but if you have quite a, you know a mixed bag maybe you've got some squares to your Neptune maybe you've got some oppositions to your Neptune if that's what it's looking like then you may end up with a bit more of the shadow side exhibiting in your personality or what you attract in your life. Let's explore what that is all about. Well some of the shadow side of Neptune is in the desire for utopia we want to see evil people punished 
and you'll see this a lot expressing in religions um, where we just want everyone who's bad to go to hell and that's actually a shadow Neptunian energy because we want to preserve utopia for the pure and everyone else can suffer you know so that's a shadow side expression of Neptune narcissism can be connected with Neptune's shadow side as well and so can uh, masochism actually uh, if we think about this um, desire to be seen as holy and pure often that connects to making ourselves falsely humble and lower than another person and that can incite in another person distaste you know and disgust for another person who is falsely humble and of course if you're familiar with the idea of masochism then you know that it's about debasing yourself in order that you might feel more worthy or more holy because you've made yourself lowly it's a very hmm, slippery shall we say um, concept and again not everything is as it seems it might seem with someone who is in a, a masochist state that they don't care about themselves that they don't love themselves that they're being cruel to themselves but very often under the surface is this energy um, of wanting the best way I can describe it to be pure through um, making yourself lowly like the flagellants did in ancient medieval times through whipping themselves oh they're so pure and holy because they're whipping themselves for Christ you know it's that kind of idea odd one but not everything is as it seems with Neptune and Neptune's shadow side projection is something that is actually a Neptunian behavioral quality coming from this psychological depth if we have separation anxiety that's a shadow side of Neptune of course it is because we are longing to return to the womb and we're and when we're separate from that safe space ugh, separation anxiety so if you're looking at those psychological issues in a chart and you know assessing that look at Neptune and what Neptune's doing in the chart shadow side of Neptune can be idealization where we don't see a person clearly for who they are but we put them on a pedestal so celebrity culture would be one expression of that um, anyone we put on a pedestal and hold up there and we create an illusion around that person it's not the truth it's not real it's not what is really going on at the core of a person to have them up on a pedestal and think that oh my god they're so perfect you know that's idealization and that's Neptune shadow side as is hysteria as is addiction addiction is another expression here um, and why because addiction is escapism if we're addicted to drugs you know usually with Neptune involved it's because we want to get away from the harshness of reality if we're addicted to uh, alcohol again it's an escape mechanism and it's an escape valve but not a healthy one because reality is too harsh and we just long to get out of here obviously deception is a shadow side of Neptune because if you're creating an illusion um, you know while there can be sort of times when that's good as in the case of glamour and that's fun and what have you sometimes when we are creating an illusion we're deceiving others we're pulling the wool over their eyes we're not being our true self and that is a shadow Neptune expression um, sacrifice I would say is a shadow Neptunian expression again it comes in close context with this false humility um, kind of behavior if we feel that we have to sacrifice ourselves for another person then we're kind of making ourselves to be better than the other person I'll go in I'll sacrifice myself and then that person will be saved um, and it's it's there's a false humility about it a deceptive humility that goes along with that and of course oftentimes when people have strong Neptune representations in the chart they lose themselves they martyr themselves for the sake of another does that benefit their life no usually <laughs> but it might make them feel spiritually greater or that they have been a noble person again we've got this sacrifice energy that's 
a bit not what it seems and this is a go also the shadow side of neptune victimization victimization is another in, um, neptunian energy where poor me i am suffering because life has been unkind and you know therefore i am longing to get away from life you know and return to the womb or go to paradise because i have been victimized you know instead of being our own savior instead of um you know making the best of things and doing what we can to transform our karma no we're a victim and we just want to escape that's so neptunian shadow side especially you could call it suffering that's seen as purity so these are some of the neptunian shadow energies i don't want to leave it on that though there are good things obviously that neptune correlates to we've talked about some of these but you know others might be the belief that there is enough for everybody and that um, the universe can be kind and the universe has our back in fact transcendence of matter is a very big neptunian theme the belief that that you know eventually good will win over evil that's neptunian as well jesus teachings jesus teachings were very neptunian he was after all the avatar for the age of pisces which was ruled by neptune so compassion unconditional love we've talked about that forgiveness healing all these things divine healing miraculous healing these are neptunian ruled um things so jesus was a big representation of neptune energy in the positive the most creative and artistic planet we've already talked about that and it's actually at its strongest capacity in water signs so neptune does very well in pisces cancer or scorpio he she will tend to give the best results if that's where he is in your natal chart but also if that's where he's transiting at any given time he's going to give the better side of himself to you neptune rules the color light blue hence i have my blue blouse on here today for this video but i've also worn my very um, well, you might not be able to see it because the color in this camera doesn't actually come up that good. I need to get a new camera, but it's actually a very beautiful velvet um, jacket that's ocean color, like the, the kind of um, tranquil turquoise that we see up on uh, you know the beaches of Queensland or some beautiful tropical beaches. And I thought seeing as Neptune rules these gorgeous oceans, I would wear my beautiful aqua turquoise color um, velvet jacket with my light blue Neptunian top. Neptune can also have connections to lavender purpley colors also. Hence, we see often people who work in spiritual sort of new agey fields have a lot of purple going on because often they've, they might not be aware of this even, but they're probably highly Neptunian people. They have a strong Neptune in their chart. And so the purple element tends to come through quite a lot. And you'll see a lot of, you know, um, websites and stuff with purple this and lavender that on um, many spiritual sites. Neptune rules the gemstone amethyst as well and so amethyst has a lot of qualities to it that correlate very strongly to Neptune. Some some tangible things and you know I did say in the beginning Neptune's more psychological yep that's true very true but Neptune does have some governance of certain items on the planet namely because of what was happening at the time Neptune was discovered what things were starting to be used and utilized when Neptune was discovered and therefore Neptune gets the rulership of those things so the ocean obviously um, but oils uh, plastics impressionism film photography advertising poisons escapism that's not actually a tangible thing but that's obviously something Neptune rules drugs as I've already illustrated, a lot of these things were being discovered. Film, photography, medications, the shipping industry, you know, steam-powered ships were really starting to get a Guernsey around the time that, that Neptune came along. So shipping and the oceans, all of these things, highly Neptunian. Now, in my Level 1 Astrology course that is coming out, um, you can learn more about Neptune and the things Neptune rules and we go into greater depth with Neptune there and its rulerships. So if you're interested in knowing more, check out that course. But what does Neptune want? It wants unwavering trust, unwavering love, an unwavering belief that the divine will come through for you. Even in the face of no evidence at all, Neptune wants us to believe. You know, if, if you are 40 odd years old and you've never had a boyfriend, Neptune is saying, keep believing and the miracle can happen. 
and I would encourage you if that's the case well wait till you're 42 who knows Neptune when it reaches its maturation at 42 may just bring you what you've been waiting for <laughs> so that's a short look at the beautiful and quite intriguing and unusual planet of Neptune now let's have a look at what Neptune is all about when he travels through a house in the horoscope and what he's going to do for you while he's there. So how can we find out where Neptune sits in the chart at any given moment? Well, firstly, you're going to need to know whereabouts Neptune is transiting in the sky. What sign is it currently in? Um, at the moment when I'm doing this video, Neptune is transiting through Pisces, but in a few years time Neptune will be in Aries and then a few years after that it will be in Taurus and so on. How do we find out where Neptune currently is? Well, I'd suggest going to a website called planetwatcher.com. It's just a quick and easy little reference where you can find out where every planet is in terms of their sign placement by transit at any point in time. So use that if you have other software that you prefer of course you can also use that but then when you found out whereabouts Neptune is transiting and you want to find out if it is your first house well it's really rather simple you just need to know your rising sign and then you work out where Neptune is sitting in reference from your rising sign so let's say let's say for example your rising sign is Gemini and you happen to know that Pisces is transiting, as it is, as I'm recording this video, through the sign of Pisces. Well, you would count from your sign, your rising sign, you would count till you got to the sign Neptune's in. In this case, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Then you would know that you need to look at the video for Neptune transiting your 10th house in whole sign astrology. But this is the video for Neptune transiting the first house. So basically, it's very simple, this one. <laughs> you just need to check your software, planetwatcher.com, for example, and find out, is Neptune currently transiting in the sign that is my rising sign? And if that happens to be the case, then this is the video for you. So this is our example, Neptune currently transiting through Pisces. Pisces would need to be your rising sign. If Neptune is transiting through Aries at this point in time when you're watching this video, then Aries would need to be your rising sign for Neptune to be transiting the first house and so on and so on around the horoscope. I hope that makes sense for people. But what does it mean for us astrologically when we have this happening? Well, it means for approximately 14 years while Neptune moves through your first house, you're going to be experiencing some certain effects, energetic effects that will play out in your life. One of these is that we will tend to lose ourselves in our emotional life a lot more than usual. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that we become a more emotional person and we're always in tears or we're throwing tantrums or whatever. It doesn't mean that at all. It just means we're far more connected with the emotional side of life and we perhaps aren't quite in our logical self as we would otherwise be at other times. Our rational self jumps in the back seat of the car and we're listening more to our emotions and our feelings. What are they telling us in terms of driving the car of our life down the road? We listen to them, we let them guide us a lot more than we otherwise would when Neptune is not transiting the first house. We're also listening to the mystical. We're listening to our higher self, if you're uh, into those mystical things. We're listening to the guidance of you're upstairs if you like you know your your higher wisdom higher knowledge your spiritual self on the other side and whether you um, experience that in an active form such as you know hearing an audible voice in your head or it's just an inner knowing about decisions that you're making or choices in life no matter what shape it takes for you personally it's that inner listening to guidance that's not necessarily coming from a place of rational thinking and in the western societies that we live in there is so much emphasis on thinking rationally logically um, that's not sensible so I won't go down that road we actually kind of we're not throwing the baby out of the bathwater but we 
we let that go a little bit now and we start to listen to what does my heart want what is my what is what are my inner needs here emotionally and that becomes the priority for our life and our decision making and the direction that we take during this 14 year transit of Neptune through the first house so the sensory side of ourselves can really increase under this influence, this energetic influence. And by that I mean you might be more tuned in to the magic of the birds singing or you might uh, enjoy a, the sense of, you know, uh, in autumn, the wafting of beautiful wood smoke in the air as people start their their fires, you know. Um, you know, different sensory experiences suddenly have a bit more richness and a bit more depth, or well, perhaps not suddenly, that's the wrong word. They start to have more richness, more depth now, and we enjoy those things, you know. We mightn't have cared two hoots about the kind of meal that we ate in the past, um, but then as the, the progress of Neptune through the sign uh, that is your first house goes on you might start to have more of a preference for food that actually tastes good or feels good to your body our senses are heightened now people it's interesting because people don't often associate Neptune with that kind of sensory world-based experience but Neptune is the higher octave of the planet Venus which is a highly um, sensual planet so it's it's not so much that Neptune is earthbound and it's all about you know in fact Neptune is far from earthbound and it's not necessarily about the things you can touch taste see hear and smell but it is about sensitivity and we become more sensitized during this transit to the beauties the wonder the magic the experiences of life in the tangible realm in the body and the body is seen by the first house our boundaries in life can also expand now one of the mantras that I have adopted during the transit of Neptune through my first house has been I expand to meet my destiny and it was almost this this mantra came into my life almost at the time Neptune changed signs and moved into my first house and it was like here's a gift from the universe Ksenia here is a mantra for this period this 14 year period of your life where you will be expanding to meet your destiny so if you're going through a first house Neptune transit this may very well be something you could adopt for your life as well because this is indeed what will be happening you will be expanding in order to take on a greater destiny greater purpose greater meaning greater spiritual fulfillment so that means um, I'll use an illustration that was given to me again at the time when Neptune changed signs and moved into my first house. A friend said to me, Ksenia, I just sense, she was quite a psychic friend, I sense that you are about to move your tent pegs back. And I believe this is a biblical reference, although I can't give you the exact um, verse and book that this, this um, reference comes from. But in moving back our tent pegs it's kind of an analogy that harks back to the the ancient Old Testament where you would have perhaps people who are out herding sheep or what, whatever and they would pitch their tents for a, I mean, a period of time while their their sheep grazed on a hillside or whatever um, and people like Job in the Bible became very wealthy um, and they would have large tents and so, you know, they're increasing family size, they're increasing amount of wives in a polygamous society would mean they would have to expand their tents, move their tent pegs out further. And this is again the mantra that fits with Neptune through the sign of Pisces. You have to pull your tent pegs out because life is going to get bigger. There are going to be less boundaries between you and the spirit world, between you and... Uh, your ability to to uh, to dream, to fantasize, to goal set, to have an ideal of what life could be like for you. Life can get bigger, not because Neptune is like Jupiter and expanding everything it tu it touches, but it is pulling the boundaries back. You know where you've kept yourself small in the past. That's not going to be applicable any longer. You have to push beyond those boundaries that have kept you small, and you have to push out. An illustration again from my life when Neptune has been transiting here is that um, I come from a very small rural community in Australia um, at the time Neptune moved into my first house I was living in a town of uh, about 2,000 people 
in the rural area I'm from. And during the course of Neptune's transit through my first house, instead of just operating in that 2000 strong community, that little town that I grew up in, suddenly my world has blown out to global proportions through my YouTube channel and interacting with people from Europe, from Africa, from America, from South America. It goes on like instead of this isolated small town girl, my boundaries have completely pushed out during the transit of Neptune through my first house. So that's an illustration of one way boundaries can expand. You might find that your boundaries expand in terms of relationships or in terms of career or in terms of friendships um, in any area of life, but certainly your own personal limitations that might be on you prior to this transit will start to be pushed back as Neptune goes through your first house and you experience an expansion of your boundaries in many facets of life. For some people, they're gonna feel more uh, connected to the whole now. It's about not being just fully contained in the earth realm. And this goes alongside the pushing back of boundaries, the expansion of boundaries. Suddenly, we feel connected to all that is. So, you know, we realize perhaps during this transit, we get a, an inner knowing about the expansiveness of the universe and our place in the universe. Maybe we start to realize how small we are in the whole scheme of how big the universe is. And we realize that maybe we are not the only life forms that exist and that, you know, we are connected to whatever happens in the Sirius star system or the Orion star system and beyond that, that everything is connected, everything influences one another and we just get this inner knowing that there is more to life than what is existing and happening in the physical realm on planet Earth, that there are other dimensions, that there are other ways of seeing the world that are different to ours, that there are other higher realms and spiritual realms. This comes into our inner knowing as we experience this transit. Now, many people might already be fully functioning with that awareness, especially if their chart, their natal chart shows that they are inclined towards spirituality and this spiritual knowingness. But for those who are not already geared that way, this is going to be quite a, an expansion of their mind and a, a revelation really. So while we're being sensitized to the material experiences on earth, we aren't going to be satisfied with material reality alone now. We know we want more. We want more substance. We want It's not about meaning or purpose, but, but we want to feel part of something that's bigger, that is more beyond us, you know. So it's it's perhaps an awareness of of the force of love or an awareness of um, the, the importance of unconditional love, we become more interested in obtaining greater depth in our experience now. So the soul calls us to go beyond the material reality of our life on earth. They're the main themes of this transit, but I've got to say it's not an easy transit by any stretch. Neptune is not an easy planet for anybody, but particularly, if, and you need to know your natal chart for this, if you have your natal Neptune with hard aspects to it from other planets, and I'm talking about oppositions and squares, then you might find that Neptune transits to certain areas of your chart are more challenging for you. One of the challenges with Neptune in the first house, the house of our assertiveness and our willpower and our self-orientation, one of the challenges that we experience is the lessening of our assertion, our self-esteem and our self-image. That kind of dissolves somewhat with Neptune's transit through the first house. Sometimes this loss of being able to assert ourselves in the world can lead to an inner rage. Now, often people will mask that because Neptune is to wear a mask. And here in the first house, we might put on the smiley, happy face for the world, but inside we are reeling with fury. A lot of people don't realize that Neptune is a planet connected with rage. We, we see that as Mars's domain, and indeed Mars does have the dominance of the rage, and certainly the violence that is the result of rage is, is a Mars thing. But when our illusions about who we are, our image, our place in the world get shattered, that can lead, that disillusionment can lead us to an inner sense of 
injustice, you know, the, the rage that goes along with injustice or I haven't been heard or I'm not seen and we get furious inside even though we can put on that nicey nice exterior when it's required. If you've been disillusioned with life and you're experiencing this transit, if you've had shattered dreams occur in your life, do some self-exploration around themes of rage and see what comes up for you because Neptune is the planet of shattered dreams. Neptune is the planet of disillusionment, of you know having had the wool pull out, pulled over our eyes and then we wake up to our reality and go, hang on, I didn't sign up for this and that leads to rage. So a lot of people, as I said, don't realize that Neptune has those connections and it's certainly worth exploring any rage that comes up in your inner being when Neptune is transiting the first house um, because this is often the case. It's also a very confusing time for some people, particularly people who have those hard aspects to their natal Neptune and people who might be uh, not really functioning in a spiritual way and suddenly they're being pulled into spiritual thinking and feeling and they're like what the hell is this I don't what I don't understand what's going on why am I feeling this way and that can be very confusing and disconcerting for the more um, <laughs> earth oriented shall we say people our self image can become very confused as well and this is usually done in a, in a more infiltrating way. When Uranus for example transits through our first house our self image goes through sudden changes, sudden shocks, big you know experimentations and um, you know I, when I had Uranus transit my first house I one month I was a redhead, the next month I was platinum blonde, the next month um, I was wearing you know long extensions and you know I was just going change 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 to my image all the time. When Neptune transits the first house we get a bit confused about our image. Now hang on am I in the rockabilly scene or am I just gonna go country girl again you know and certainly it's a bit more ambiguous and more infiltrating um, and certainly while Neptune's been transiting my first house I've gone from being um, heavily involved in rockabilly self-expression and image at the beginning of this transit and slowly and gradually that's worn away to a completely different look that I have going on now if you look back at my earliest videos you will see, observe the change but it's sort of come along very gradually over the course of Neptune's transit here and it's nowhere near as shocking and f marked with you know notable change the way Uranus's transit through the first house was. Another of the difficulties with this transit is that Neptune can exaggerate things. Um, you know, our perceptions of the world, which is what the first house is connected to, how we perceive the world to be, can become very exaggerated and idealistic, a bit delusional now, and this can lead to poor decision making. So if you if you're finding that you're struggling to get a clear handle on the world <laughs> during this transit then maybe seek out some uh, a, an advisor a friend somebody with a lot of wisdom that you can bounce ideas off now those of us who have Neptune without any hard aspects in the chart and so Neptune is strong and healthy um, and it, for people like myself who are Pisces rising when Neptune is at home, Neptune rules Pisces, then we might find that this is not so much the case. Um, certainly I know that with my Neptune transiting, sorry with Neptune transiting my first house I have found that I'm far more clear in my decision making than I've ever have been before. I may still have a lot of ideals but hey I'm Pisces and I'm idealistic anyway um, so that's always going to be the case for me. So if you go through this transit though and you're finding that you're feeling a bit disillusioned and you're not really sure what's going on and you're confused, um, do get advice to help you through this, this journey. Now as we've already established this is a time of no boundaries in our life. We can expand out and push back on things that have limited us in the past but the shadow side and there is always a shadow side remember to this is that we can be more gullible. Uh, we can be exploited because we're you know we're easily deceived now when we have no boundaries no sort of now hang on a minute buster we're not going there you know and that certainly happened to me certainly in the dating scene. Um, uh, in the in the workplace as well where those sorts of things have happened. I won't go into great detail with any of those. <laughs> I'd like to preserve people's dignity but 
we can certainly be um, be disillusioned and deceived by by people in certain circumstances when we're having a Neptune transit to the first house. We can have that at other times in our life too. Let's not make any mistakes here. <laughs> but, but, but they do tend to be a bit more pronounced and noticeable when Neptune transits the first house. Another thing that plays out while Neptune is transiting the first house is longing because Neptune is very connected to longing. And this kind of ties into the fact that Neptune is quite idealistic. If we're idealistic and we have an ideal, like a, a dream of how beautiful life could be and um, you know how, how the world should function in a better way, and we have these dreams and they don't turn out and we get disillusioned and we might experience some rage about it, what then results is this shattering of our perceptions can lead us to longing to escape and we see this exhibited I might have already talked about this we see this exhibited with uh, religions where it, the earthly life doesn't matter all that matters is going home to heaven they're sick of the earth reality that's too harsh and they just want to escape and go be with Jesus or whatever it happens to be whatever religion you know that they, they want to get out of here they long to go home some people wish they'd never been born when life gets too tough and so there's a longing to sort of go back to the pre-birth state, if you like, to the womb. So because when Neptune is transiting the first house, we can, we can sometimes become dissatisfied with the harshness of material, material reality, we get this longing to go home. And <laughs> I only, this only just tweaked for me in the last year or so. But ever since Neptune has started transiting, or when Neptune started transiting my first house, I do a lot of my praying in the shower every morning and my deep thinking and what have you is being in the water really helps with that. And every morning in the shower, I'm just like, I just want to get out of here. I just want to go home. Um, that's, that's my longing. That's all I want is I've had enough of this earthly life. <laughs> it just so happens that uh, Neptune's transit through my first house has happened to coincide with becoming a single mum. <laughs> there were other factors that caused that. And it's all been too much and I can't cope and I just want to go home. Take me up to the stars. I've had it, you know. Um, and <laughs> it's only the realisation dawned on me in the last year. Aha, uh -huh, the longing, the Neptunian longing has been present in my life since Neptune moved into my first house. Now we've talked about sensitivity and how sensitive we can become under this transit and that includes our body because this is the house of the body and the body can become very sensitive as well. So we can sometimes develop mystery illnesses. Now this is particularly if Neptune has those hard aspects that I talked about in the natal chart then sometimes a mystery illness might come up or we find that every winter we're constantly suffering from a, a, an unnamed allergy or a, a difficult cold that always comes on every winter and it's the same debilitating experience or you know we we can find that we are more susceptible to bodily especially mysterious bodily ailments so this includes but it's not limited to bloating allergies fluid retention candida or thrush these kinds of things um, can crop up a lot more than usual, particularly if we might be prone to those things from, you know, now and again during Neptune's transit of the first house. They just happen more frequently. Now, Neptune, Neptune is renowned for its drug addiction and alcohol addiction qualities. But I need to quantify this because Neptune is so much more than you know than that shadow side to it and it, it, it actually I get a bit hurt when people say oh Pisces is addiction oh Neptune is addiction yeah it is because we want to escape and I've already talked about the longing to get out of here because it's just too hard and too harsh and too much and I didn't sign up for this and that's what this, the, the drug addiction, the alcohol addiction, that's what that is. It's not like, you know, I'll oh, give me more alcohol because it's fun. You know, it's, I can't handle this earthly reality and I just want to tap out for a bit. So please be aware, you know, when, when you experience people who have a, a strong Neptune in their chart, with a lot of hard aspects to it or a strong Pisces with you know difficult aspects as well and they're struggling with some sort of addiction it's usually the cause the root cause is usually because they're not coping with the harshness of material Saturnian earthly reality so if you're prone to this sort of thing and you have Neptune transiting your first house then it can be 
more difficult for you. Um, and the body, because it's highly sensitized, it's more reactive now to substances. So where you might have had two glasses of wine every evening prior to Neptune transiting your first house, when Neptune transits your first house, suddenly that two glasses of wine is enough to get you really, really off your face um, because the body's more sensitive to the drug component of the alcohol. Um, so do be careful if you are susceptible to a bit of, you know, substance abuse um, and you're going through this transit because it could be exacerbated. Another thing that's on the shadow side of this transit is that secret affairs can unfold. Um, you know, you may be the purest angel in the world and think I will never, would never, could never. And then along comes Neptune through your first house and the dissatisfaction ensues and the rage rises up inside you and the longing to return home and, you know, loss of the dream can happen for some people. And what do we do? We find an outlet valve and we find an escape mechanism for some people like we've just talked about, it's drugs and alcohol. For other people, it is finding a, a new love, um, stepping into the arms of somebody who appears to us to be unconditionally loving, doesn't put parameters on who we are as people. We feel um, like coming home when we're with them and Ta-da, even though we don't intend it, secret affairs can ensue. Not always though, please underline that. It's not always going to be the case for everyone having a Neptune transit to the first house. You would need to know what's in your natal chart, if there's an inclination to that sort of thing already there. Um, you would also need to have a look at the quality of your Neptune in your natal chart, but that is one of the, the possibilities. There could also be some changes in your relationships in general and changes in how you relate to other people as well because Neptune in the first house is sitting opposite the house of relationships, the, whole, the, the house of partnerships. So how you connect with others, which is seen by the seventh house, is going to be quite sort of distanced and that Neptunian element by aspect to the seventh house comes in here. So yeah, changes, um, how you related say to maybe a family member or a business partner or something might completely turn around, but it'll sort of happen in a way that's a bit more stealth. It's not like suddenly you're ripping a bandaid off and you know, you're never gonna deal with that person again, goodbye. No, it kind of stealthily comes in and you just have less and less and less to do with that person and you go your separate ways. That's how Neptune works. It's slowly infiltrating. Now back to the more positive side of things now. This is a period in life when we can feel more generous, more giving, more unconditionally loving, more charitable because that's what Neptune is. Neptune is the planet of unconditional love and charity. And it is a very generous planet because no boundaries, right? We can also get incredibly imaginative and creative under this influence. This is the planet um, of the, uh, the most divine expression of art and dance and music and creative writing and imaginative uh, endeavors. So if you are inclined that way and you enjoy that sort of thing, my goodness, you could have a very productive, very um, uplifting 14 years in that zone. Neptune is the planet of magic as well. So for some people, they may have magical experiences during this time. So magical events for some, transcendence, you know, transcending worldly you know, trials and tribulations by going into spirit and just being above it all. That's obviously the, the higher manifestation of this energy, um, if you can achieve that. Um, and just general higher realm experiences, more spiritual experiences. It's, it can be a very beautiful transit. And even the sort of the more crunching life experiences that we have during this 14 year period, they can take us ultimately to a higher plane, to a higher experience of unconditional love, to a higher expression of artistry, to a more spiritually deep, profound state of being. So in that sense, we can have gratitude for the more challenging experiences that unfold because they may be leading us to a higher plane. In fact, fate is often pulling the strings during this time of our life. Um, things might feel like they're way out of control, that we don't have any say in that affair that we have or that drug addiction that we're, we're struggling with. You know, things might feel like they're out of control. 
But it's okay to let go and let God. In fact, that's one of the purposes of Neptune is learning to, it wants to teach us to go with the, go with the flow, to learn to let the universe, let divine love just lead us. And sometimes we have to be led through the valley of the shadow, to quote the Bible again. Um, we have to be led through the valley of the shadow in order to climb up the mountainside and get the view from the top of the hill. So, you know, I'm not saying you don't fight that addiction. I'm not saying, end, you know, don't end that affair. But I'm saying see it for what it is. The universe trying to lead you to a higher perspective in life. And you may need to still do the work to deal with the problems that are ensuing, obviously. Finally, this Neptune transit is also a time when we can see people dissolved out of our life, toxic people, people who are putting limits on us that are not part of our expansion and our moving beyond the boundaries and limitations that we have on ourselves. If possessions are holding you back, if behaviors are holding you back, this 14 year transit can dissolve those limitations, those you know expectations from other people and so on, out of your life. Remember, above all, Neptune's purpose is to connect us to divine love. So during this transit, whatever is in your physical, bodily, first house, bodily experience that is keeping you from truly knowing the fullness of divine love, it may very well be dissolved out of your life so that you can ultimately experience joy of connection with the divine. It's not always an easy process. But like I said, that is the purpose of this transit. And you will be transformed in a very infiltrating, sort of stealthy way by Neptune during this 14 year period of your life. I hope it's a good one for you. And no coincidences though. Mm. So Neptune is, uh, comes, Basically, the astronomers of the time when Neptune discovered we're going to when Neptune was just correlating to the nature of Neptune. Basically, when we're 